Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash tales from tech support. In today's episode. The Weekend Rollout, a short series. The Weekend Rollout, conclusion. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. The Weekend Rollout, a short series. This is a short series about a weekend rollout early on in my career. To set the stage, I'm working on the help desk at an advertising agency, and it's the late 1990s. The agency was in a three-story building at the bottom of a gentle hill in a suburban office park. When I started, they had the top floor, but they landed a big client, went on a hiring binge, and took over the second floor of the building. We benefited somewhat from this. The three of us in the IT department were employees of a value-added reseller, VAR, so they made money from staffing the help desk and from all the Macs the agency bought for their new employees. By we benefited, I mean my employer made some profits selling the hardware. I was on salary, but I kept hearing we're all a family here, so I figured it was best to play along and work the weekend. Anyhow, the building lease gave us access to the new area on Friday. The ad agency expected to have about 20 new employees ready to go Monday morning, as well as moving another 30 employees into the new area. We were all expected to work the weekend to make this go smoothly. As you might guess, it didn't. Having previously worked in restaurants, I tried to prepare as much as possible. I had cleared our bench to prepare the new Max. I'd have to install a handful of applications from CDs or floppies, set IP addresses, printers. I'd also have to prep the desk phones. Friday rolled around. The truckload of Macs and monitors hadn't showed up. Neither had the desks or cubicles. I had a Pavlovian reaction to trucks pulling into the parking lot. More importantly, half of the new space didn't have any Ethernet wiring. We'd have to do this in addition to all the other work. Friday night, we ran cable. The unwired space is long and thin, maybe 6MX20M, 18X60. There's a conduit up to the third floor and our NOC at one end of this space. There are also three pillars in the room with channels for cabling. Our plan is to run about 30 cables from the NOC above the drop ceiling, with 10 cables going down each pillar, then into the cubicles. We have the cable spools, plates and ends, but we're waiting for the fish to pull the cable. They're on the truck with the max that we're waiting for. Time is of the essence here, and we're on country time. I'd make a joke about carting the shipment via horse and buggy, but more than one Stoltzfus worked at the head office. I'm waiting around with Drew, my boss, and Francis, the beardy sysadmin, while the workers building the cubicles moved around with purpose, like they knew what they were doing. Drew, they'll be finished tomorrow, so we have to get the wiring in tonight. Me, all we need is a fish. There's definitely enough tape and string in the art department storeroom. I can run down to the local hardware megamart and be back in 20. I had my girlfriend's Volvo for the weekend and I reveled in the idea of a car that always started when I turned the key. Francis, no. We won't get reimbursed for a tool we already have. Drew's StarTac flip phone rings. He answers it and walks to an empty office to have a brief, sad conversation. He walks back out with an unhappy face. Drew, truck's not coming. We don't have the new Max yet. Me, so no fish, no Max. I have phones, but no phone lines. Should I come back tomorrow morning? Francis shoots me a stern look. Drew, no. Let's remove the ceiling tiles and take a look. After some cursing, we realize that there's a lot of stuff above the drop ceiling. Without a fish or a cooperative cat, no cable is going to be pulled tonight. Drew and Francis start making phone calls. Francis, Jacob isn't too far away. He wants to take a look. 20 minutes later, Jacob arrives with his son. Jacob is one of the owners. He's a tall, dar man. 
Jacob's son is a sullen teenager who finds an excuse to go down to the parking lot and play with a remote control pickup truck. Jacob isn't a detail guy, he's a leader. I'm pretty sure he's got a framed accessories poster that says that in his home. Jacob, I don't care what you have to do, but this all has to be cabled tonight. Jacob and Drew then wander off to schmooze with the management at the ad agency. Francis and I are looking out the window at the near-empty parking lot. An idea hits us simultaneously. We quickly come up with a plan. We'll use the R-C truck to run clothesline from the pillars to the third-floor conduit. We can then hook the clothesline from above to pull cabling across the drop ceiling. We run down and flag the kid, who is suddenly interested. Francis and I alternate between slowly feeding rope up through the pillars and giving teenager driving directions while standing on recently built desks. After a nerve-wracking 45 minutes, we have three clotheslines running between the third floor NOC and the second floor pillars. Once we have cables cut and taped, we can start pulling them all up. This causes the attention of the workers building the cubicles, since it seems that we're playing while they're working. As the new guy, I get to start cutting the ethernet and phone cabling and taping them up for pulling. Jacob and son leave to go home, while Drew, Francis, and I finish the cabling and pull all three bundles into the NOC by 1 a.m. Drew works farmer's hours and wants me at the office by 8 a.m. Saturday to patch all this into the network. I'm too tired to notice one small problem. We've got desks. We're getting max. We've run cables, but we don't have the network switches to accommodate the new users. I drove home and tried to shake the dust out of my hair and get a few hours sleep for tomorrow. The Weekend Rollout, Conclusion This is the conclusion of a story at an ad agency a long time ago that starts here. Saturday The next morning, I drive my less-than-reliable rover to work, stopping at a convenience store to pick up a flat of coffees for my coworkers. I make it in around 8.15. Drew's in his office, dealing with something else. Francis and Jacob aren't here yet. Neither is the truck. Drew accepts my gift of coffee, then hands me a punch-down tool and a cheap walkie-talkie. The next few hours are spent pulling cables apart and punching them into the Type 110 blocks in the NOC. That's the plan, at least. For each of the cables, I have to cut the outer insulation, splay out the wires and push them into the blocks mounted about 8 feet from the ground, then push them in with the screwdriver like punch-down tool. I then repeat with the patch cable to the switch. Or at least where the switch should be. I have about 6 open ports to use so I can test the connections on these cables. Hopefully a switch shows up before Monday morning. Unfortunately, Someone cracked the blade of the punch-down tool, so it sometimes slips when I push the wires into the contacts, causing me to punch my hand into the sharp plastic. At the end of this exercise, my hands are pretty chewed up. Drew comes into the NOC to tell me that the truck's here. We have one of those hand trucks that extends into a longer, four-wheeled cart. We use this to take all the boxes off the truck and wheel them into the help desk office and the hallway outside. Drew gives me a hand with moving the boxes around, then runs back to his office to deal with something else he's particularly concerned about. I start a production line. Open box, take out a beige PowerMac G3. Install extra RAM, then plug into the bench monitor and start installing our usual suite of apps MS Office, a calendar app, our email application, and a few other apps. Then I'd customize it for a specific user set a name and password, set the IP address and local printer. Once I had two ready to go, I'd unbox two monitors, two phones and cart the whole bunch upstairs to set up in the new employees' cubicles, using a photocopied schematic as a map. I use the Mac to test the network connection over the cables, then go to the NOC, unplug the cables, and move the next two cables to the switch. I'd love to have the switch installed, but I'm waiting for Francis to show up and take care of it. I also quickly learned to avoid the shiny brass key sticking out of the locking cabinet in each new desk after I get a nice bruise in my thigh. 
After that, I drag the hand truck down to the first floor and start the process over. At some point Drew tosses me a hoagie and a soft drink, then reminds me that we have to move 30 current employees' phones and Max over. Thankfully, Drew is willing to help for a few hours, then goes home to spend time with his family. Sounds nice, I guess. I'm at least getting exercise and free air conditioning. The cubicle builders are finishing up and we're at least on a nodding acquaintance. Francis calls and tells me that he isn't going to be in until Sunday afternoon, but wants me to put the switches in the rack and wire them up and he'll do the rest. I'm exhausted, so I cart the switches up to the NOC, but leave them there. I get home around 1 a.m., have two drinks with friends and promptly fall asleep on a couch. Sunday. I am sore, tired and my day is starting badly. I left the headlights on my rover, so I have to charge the battery a bit before driving to work. I get to the office around 11 a.m. and finish up moving a few remaining Macs before racking up the switches. I spend more time fighting with the cabling than I'd like and the NOC is noisy, so I don't notice my pager buzzing for 45 minutes. It's Drew. I give him a call. Drew, hey why didn't you call earlier? Me, sorry, I was in the NOC and couldn't hear. Drew, Lori called and she's really unhappy. Go figure out what she wants and fix it. UG. Lori is, well, unpleasant. She's the off and on girlfriend of Chuck, the creepy manager in the art department. Lori doesn't like us and finds petty ways of making our lives more difficult. One week, I decided to bicycle the four miles from the train station instead of driving, which got me fairly sweaty. I was going to use the shower in the building gym when she reminded me that the gym was only for employees. She also would demand that we park up at the top of the hill by the dumpsters rather than any of the closer spots. It was petty, but we put up with it. Lori's stomping around with a clipboard in her hand. Lori sees me and power walks up to me. Lori, you did this all wrong. Where's Drew? Me, there, Drew's home. What's wrong? Lori, you didn't follow the schematic. People are in the wrong places. Me, I used the schematic Drew gave me. She shoves a printed dock and she's right. There is a difference. I'm going to have to move about 10 Macs and phones. The Macs will be easy just move the CPU and leave everything else. Moving the phones on the other hand will be a pain. Our phone system is a fine bit of technology, but only Francis has the admin login. If I want to move phones, I'll have to pull and repunch the cables at the punch down block. I'll have to wait for Francis to show up. I apologize to Lori and tell her that I'll get on it. Lori walks off. Ten minutes later, my pager buzzes. It's Drew again. I call him from the closest cubicle. Me, hey. Drew, Lori's still annoyed. You left a mess downstairs. Me, the boxes? I'll break them down once I'm done rearranging the Macs and phones. Drew, what? Me, she told me we were using the wrong schematic. Drew, what? Me, look. I'll take care of the boxes for now. Drew, fine. I can't fill the little recycling bins in the building with all the boxes. I'm going to have to cart them up to the dumpsters at the top of the hill. I break down the boxes and put the styrofoam and plastic in trash bags. This is going to take a few trips with the cart. On the way back, I realize that there's one advantage in working on a Sunday. The lot is empty, save two cars my rover at the top of the hill and her newish BMW in the closest spot to the door. I'm not going to pull this cart down the hill, I'm going to ride it. By the third trip, I'm able to steer it well enough to hit the ramp and get to the doors of the building in style. I'm hoping to see if I can drift it the next trip. I don't. On the fourth trip, I misjudge the distance between two parking stops and flip the cart onto two wheels. I fall off, but the cart goes in a new direction, hitting the passenger side of Lori's car. Oops. I quickly run up and grab the cart. 
There's a clear scrape in the paint. I hope Lori wasn't watching. I finish up carting the trash and don't ride back down. I'll let Drew and Lori fight over the correct placement of the Max while I finish up with the switches. After half an hour, the switches seem to be routing packets. I do some ping tests and email them to Francis to let him know. I see an email from Drew thanking me for my hard work and to take the rest of the weekend off and to be here early Monday to help train the new employees. Monday morning comes quickly. I show up, pour myself a cup of coffee and walk up to the new office space, filling with new people waiting for an orientation taught by Lori and Drew. Drew is almost giddy. He waves me over to a large candy bowl, which is filled with keys. It takes a second for the keys to register. They're the keys to the new desks. Someone had removed them all from the desks and put them in this bowl. Drew just pawed through them with a giant grin. Drew, get this. She thought it was a security risk to leave the keys in the desks. I went downstairs to get ready for the flurry of help desk calls for the new people. Including more than one asking to have their phone extension changed. Seems in all the confusion, I didn't ask Francis to move them. And we did get a few calls to have desks rekeyed. I forwarded those tickets to Lori.